Um, that's a new destination for me. I'm actually from Philadelphia, and the movie that I'm going to show you is, is, um, takes place there. Um, I just want to talk about, you know, some of the differences because I'm really from a different place and how I got to be where I am as a filmmaker, which is that I'm making a documentary film and working it for three years. I've made seven feature films. They each take three to five years. And luckily I have three kids along the way, so I've got three kids and seven movies, which is pretty good. Um, and something to keep in mind, start having kids young because when you have energy to push them in the swings. But and then later I got to coach soccer and I'm always looking for compelling stories that get to the heart of issues of justice and equality. Um, I, I grew up in the, in the 60s in an African-American neighborhood that had been home to the Underground Railroad. And I became very influenced by who I was growing up with. And as I became a parent, I became very concerned with who my children were going to become. And as a parent of two daughters, I became very protective of my daughters. And so I'm going to open with a theme, which I think is very self-explanatory, which is, from my point of view, it's personal, and I need to protect my daughters. And the way I can protect my daughters is to make sure that they become strong, independent, thoughtful young women who are confident. Every day, I tell my daughters, I love you. Every day, I tell them that they're beautiful. When I set out to make this film about the Anderson Monarchs, I got that feeling right away. I love these girls, and I love what they're doing. But they're just kids, and they don't even really understand fully what they're doing. So I discovered that all I had to do was turn the camera on and bear witness. So we're going to kick this off with a clip that kind of shows you the movie in a few minutes, and then I'm going to talk about who are the, Manders, who are the Anderson Monarchs and why they're making history, because I know they're making history. These girls are dynamite. So let's roll the film. My name is Kyla Candy. I pay for the Anderson Monarchs on the tour. <laughs> this is a game where you only need a ball. I went to the inner cities because that's where the future of this game is. going out to a field where the practice gets broken up by gunshots. This kid just got killed like a week ago in Kensington. He's seen go up his whole life. The field itself is, is overused, uh, dirty. We've got to clear condoms and drug needles and broken bottles off the field. The program obviously isn't just about soccer, is it? never was. It was yeah. always about education, mentoring, guidance. There aren't a lot of avenues for the girls in the urban population. People who are in the city, they see us play, then they want to get into playing soccer. Do you think soccer is going to take you places? Yeah, I love soccer. Soccer's a way out. When I saw that trailer, I can't, couldn't believe that was my movie because I was working for about two years and had about five hours of, of film that, that I had shot, and it was, this was the first thing that we did. But it was amazing to give the images to someone else that I didn't even ever meet, Rob Lyons in New York City, and I was working in Dallas at the time, and I came on it, and there it was. And at first, I, was, I have to be honest, I was a little hesitant about it because of the shooting and everything. 
And then as we, and so I spent about six weeks where I didn't show the trailer to anyone, and I looked through all the footage around all the filming, and I didn't even know this, but when we were filming one day, there was a shooting 50 yards away while we were filming. And we had actually filmed all of the discussion around it, so I decided that it was okay. And then I showed it to one of the parents, the guy that's interviewed behind the fence. I said, are you okay with this? And he said, yes, I am, because it's true. So it's really a fine line between being potentially exploitive, especially of stories about children, but also what I call bearing witness, which is revealing the truths about their lives. Um, so the Anderson Monarchs are named after Marian Anderson, who um, was a very famous African-American singer. They're also named after Jackie Robinson's baseball team, the Monarchs. And they're based out of this small rec center in, in South Philadelphia, which is sort of the land of Rocky and cheesesteaks, things like that, literally. Um, they are coached by a man named Walter Stewart, who, who used to be married. He gave up a partnership in a law firm to start teaching elementary school. He was defending major law firms major insurance companies at a, a very Philadelphia big law firm, and really uh, had four children of his own, was coaching soccer, and decided he wanted to do that full time. Um, his marriage dissolved, and he just kept going with the Monarchs. Three of his children are at, one's at Princeton, one's at Bryn Mawr, and one's at Swarthmore. Um, so he is an incredible guy. He's what we call a change maker. He's somebody that a singular individual is able to organize a community and create change in that community. And that's a word that we're familiar with, but when you meet somebody that's really like that, um, it's there. So some of the stills, I guess they're just playing. Um, I was on the field starting to work on the movie in the fall of 2008, and Sports Illustrated came by, and they, they were asking me what makes the Monarch so good. And I had been coaching my daughter and playing the Monarchs, and they would beat us like 5 nothing. And I said, well, they are really good. In fact, they're so good, they're really fierce. And they did a little more research, and the writer ended up nominating them for Sports Team of the Year in 2008, alongside somebody named Tiger Woods, Barack Obama, and I think, you know, maybe Ben Roethlisberger. And it was the first time that an amateur club had been nominated. So they don't actually have a field. They share a patch of dirt with three football teams, many softball teams, and also people that ride dirt bikes. There's no grass on the pitch, actually. It's all weeds, and two-thirds of it now is a baseball diamond. Um, in an outfield. Um, the way girls join is they walk up and they say, can I play? If they can't afford it, they don't get paid. There's, there's a girl named Brianna um, who's on the team. She lives in the neighborhood. There's a girl named Jalen. Jalen grew up across the street. She um, now is in a process of playing nationally in the ECNL, which some of you know is the National Touring Soccer, and she's 13 years old. Um, they do this with virtually no money. They get donations for uniforms, cleats. Um, in the film, you see how they sort of hodgepodge this together for 100 girls. They practice 50 weeks a year. Um, another writer called them the future of American soccer. And I was, as I was watching the World Cup this summer, I was wondering, wow, what if they had a couple of monarchs on their team? How good would they be? And I'll tell you how good they would be. They would win the World Cup because these kids are absolutely dynamite on the field. Um, Coach Waltz are brilliant absolutely brilliant coach. Um, they train for 50 weeks a year, a third of the year they're inside. So what is it about them that I think is important to share with you? I would say overall they're pretty happy kids. This isn't the ghetto story of, oh, the poor kids and all of this kind of stuff. They don't think of themselves that way. I'm not depicting them that way. I think the way that they think of themselves is pretty confident kids, but what happens is that they become more confident as they become healthier and stronger and start eating better. They start going to better schools. They are recruited constantly by the best clubs in the region, and it's very difficult because the other clubs can offer you the nice uniforms, the ECNL, you know, the looks at the college coaches by the age of 11 even. They're looking at these girls. And I go back to the same idea. I want to protect my girls, and I think that we need to protect our girls. And sports is a way to do that. You know, at the highest level of sports, we all know we're in a post-hoop dreams world. We know what happens. We know that sports is not the golden ticket. It's really education. And you know what? The girls know that too. And so what they're doing is they're developing their minds as well as their bodies. Um, and they're becoming excellent, excellent students. Right now, five are in the Olympic Development Program for U.S. Women's National Soccer. Three have won very prestigious scholarships, academic, where they can play soccer if they would like. Um, some are doing both. Some do have plans to play both. Um, and 
I, I think the other thing that's remarkable about them is that they win, 50 per, they win 80 percent of the time. And so some of it is when they put on the uniform, they sort of transform. And, and the really important thing to understand about them is that they're not like a club where kids just walk up. What I discovered is that the girls are driving from all over the city, and the parents are recognizing that the color of their daughter's skin is defining who they are. And what they want to do by putting the girls together is to have them even rethink how they define themselves by working together in this really incredible sisterhood. So they do have a very star player. Her name is Jalen Flippins. Jalen is now um, working her way up through the ECNL. She plays two years up. She's a 13-year-old. She plays with 15 years old. She's a striker. And she said to me that, I asked her, what is so special about the Monarchs and why did you leave? And she said, I had to leave to get better training. But she still lives across the street, so she still trains with them about a third of the year because it's part of her family. And she said the biggest thing was a bond. That was the biggest thing. They, became, they bonded so well and they played so great and they've won so many championships. Um, I followed the girls to Florida where five of them were selected for the world championships um, with Jalen was in that group. She came back to the Monarchs to play with them. And I have to tell you, it was absolutely dynamite. They came in ninth in the world for girls under 12 from over 700 teams. And I, was, I felt like every second I was there in this very surreal place that I was watching something real unfolding. And when I asked them a couple years later what was a big experience, that was part of it. They get to travel and meet people, have new experiences. They're incredibly outgoing. They're very interesting and funny. Um, all of those kinds of things. Um, I think that um, to go back to what the girls are doing and what some of the things that they don't see, they don't see the notion of courage, although they do say that sometimes they'll line up and they'll notice that you know, the other teams kind of give them a funny look when they're only, you know, they're, they're the only um, African-American kids that are there. Um, and, but they just, they just carry on, they, they keep going and, and, they, and they get together. A lot of times they don't have enough players. Their number one issue is transportation. Many of the families don't have cars and they can't get the girls to the games, which they play in a three-state region. They do play the top states in the region. Um, right now they have an under-11 team and an under-15 team. Um, but at the end of the day, the thing that I would say that's really powerful about them is that when you change something within your family, you then make a permanent change moving forward that then impacts the community that you're in. And so what you see with the Monarchs is that they're coming from all over the city, even from outside of the city, and one by one the girls are making steps forward. Some of the parents are college educated, some never graduated from high school, but the thing that's happening is that each girl is now starting to give back to the club. And so you've got a whole group of girls, the oldest girls now are 18 and 19, and the youngest are six. So you're gonna have within a few years, you may see an Anderson Monarch in the next World Cup. You may see an Anderson Monarch at Princeton. You may see one, you know, if you're in the ECNL, and some of you in here are probably in the ECNL, you may see someone from the Anderson Monarchs on that club that you're playing with. So a lot of it is about transformation through your formative years. And I think that, again, for me it's personal. If you can spend time, the thing that people don't understand about kind of community work, or even if as a filmmaker, the thing that I had to do for them was to be consistent. I didn't do any interviews with the girls for a year and a half. Um, I always worked through their parents to gain their trust. And if there's something in the film that they don't like, you know, I'll take it out because I don't want to depict them in a way that isn't really representative. So the three-year journey is coming to an end. Uh, I finished a, a big Kickstarter campaign, which is what brought me here. And the film is nearing final music and all the elements. And next year, it's minimally going to be released through the Sundance digital releasing platform. So it'll be on Netflix and iTunes and, and Amazon and all the kind of spaces that the film can go to. Um, and I think that the, the thing that I admire most about the girls is courage. I mean, the courage to come to that practice field, even when there's violence and it's real and it's there, um, to even play against teams that are better funded. You've got nine players and they're not going to back down. Even when you can't get to the game, many of the girls play on two teams at the same time. Many of them don't have uniforms and they have to sort of cobble that together. I think that the courage that they show is absolutely remarkable. 
And as they get older, they understand that they are wearing history on their sleeve. They are wearing the legacy of Jackie Robinson and Marian Anderson, and I think that's incredibly powerful. And so all I have to say really is that sometimes by observing the courage of others, we can find the courage within ourselves. And at the top tier of anything, whether it's entrepreneurship or athletics, or in my case, trying to be present in family and community, is that you have the courage to make the right choice. So I would just say, you're all pretty smart and sophisticated. You've made it this far, so just keep making those choices, and you'll be as dynamite as the Anderson Monarchs. All right, thank you.